All right, so uh, as I said, my name is Mike Tallhammer. Uh, I'm a physicist, chief of physics for Centura Health uh, in Denver, Colorado. Uh, I work for Centura Health. We have a number of facilities um, throughout the Denver metro area as well as all over Colorado, ranging as far south and west as Durango and all, all the way up north through Longmont, Colorado, which is near Boulder, Colorado. So we have a number of different facilities. Our outfit uh, tends to be a little bit different. Some are multi Linux sites, some are single Linux sites, some have Vision RT uh, products such as Gate CT and Align RT, and other ones uh, are just standard Linux operations. We have a couple of Brain Lab systems, a CyberKnife, uh, and a number of other things. Uh, Jonathan was going to talk about uh, commissioning. Oh, that's my disclosure slide. Jonathan was going to talk about commissioning, so this was supposed to be the really fast slide. Uh, so we're going to talk a little slower to this morning. Um, commissioning for an SGRT system is a little bit unique, uh, as I'm sure some of you who have it have noticed that it's a, a uniquely decoupled system from the rest of the Linux. Um, these are all the different uh, task group reports that we have, and there's a bunch of new ones since I created this slide uh, related to commissioning and quality assurance. Uh, but commissioning essentially ends up being a process type of thing. We commission our Linux, we commission our uh, surface-guided radiation therapy systems, uh, using a, a variety of number of task groups, but the, the overall system is, is a um, observer-based pattern. So an optical guided system or a computer vision system sees the result of your commissioning. So when you're seeing shifts on patients, you're looking at QA of those types of things, you're looking at a, a, a totality of what the system's viewing. You're looking at inconsistencies in your couch as far as your couch walkout, those types of things. You're looking at camera calibration issues as far as optical uh, inconsistencies or variation across the lens of the camera. You're also looking at um, variations uh, in true patient motion. So uh, is the patient really moving or is this some combination of all these other effects? And so commissioning is designed to basically characterize the system so you understand the system and know the system so that you can help kind of tease out these inf pieces of information once you're in the clinic and the, the physician looks at you and says, was that a real movement? And at least give them some sort of information. So what does that mean to our QA programs and setting up QA programs? Um, before you can set up a QA program, you have to kind of decide what you're going to be treating. This is a, our informal tree of complexity over here that we use. We're treating all of these indications at our sites and a number of others. Um, it, it go from the bottom of the tree up. It's a kind of moving up in complexity from standard breasts and palliative type cases, bone mets, uh, all the way up through your pelvis, your partial brains, your head and necks, and then moving on into more complex treatments like trigeminal neuralgia, acoustics, AVMs, uh, deep inspiration breath hold, but deep inspiration breath hold for SBRT now, uh, which is a different type of process versus deep inspiration breath hold for like left-sided breast or chest walls. Uh, so a QA program for one part of the tree uh, for some of these indications might look a little different than a QA program if this is what you're trying to do. And so you need to look at the complexities and the uncertainties associated with the types of treatment you want to do so that you can set up a QA program that kind of makes sense for what you want to do. Now, without a commissioning talk, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about commissioning, but um, without a commissioning talk, basically that's your time to characterize the system so you kind of know the accuracy of the system, the overall positional accuracy. I tell everyone you need to do, do an absolute accuracy test and a relative accuracy test. You see a lot of published papers that say, I validated the system. I moved five centimeters. The system said I moved five centimeters. That is a relative accuracy. You need to know where the true isocenter of the system is uh, because when you have a rotation or you're treating these non-coplanar type fields for SRS, um, if you're looking at the more highly complex things, as you rotate, if your isocenters are not true accuracy, then you end up having these leverage effects as you rotate around an isocenter that's not the same as your machine. And those rotations then show up as translations, and that's not what we want because then that is perceived as a patient motion. So TG147 is kind of the governing task group currently uh, that we all kind of fall back to. Um, it is kind of an all-inclusive task group. It's, I, I would say, fairly well written. Uh, it's one of the better ones that I've read, but it does refer to a lot of other task groups. So they, they don't waste a lot of time and a lot of fluff rehashing things that we've already done. Uh, they basically will point you to other task groups. Uh, one of the important things is it also references principles from TG100, though it predates TG100 by a number of years. Um, the, the concepts are there, so you can kind of see the, the forethought of the physics community in saying that these systems, uh, these non-radiographic systems, require some sort of process characterization, uh, which is largely the focus of TG100. Uh, so later on, we kind of caught up with ourselves, it seems like. 
Uh, task group 147 is kind of, again, an end-to-end. -end. If you're not familiar with these systems, it's a good place to start. It covers acceptance and commissioning. It also covers a group of tests that we, at Centura, we refer to them as performance evaluation tests. Um, it's not referred to as that in the, in the uh, task group report itself, but the QA concepts that the task group sets out is something that's more geared towards you understanding the characteristics of the system, not just running through a menu of tests a la TG40, TG142 with a set of tolerances that you need to meet every month. Uh, that being said, I lied to you. They do give you a set of tolerances and tables and things for daily, monthly, and annual QA. Um, all of these tests are there, and I'm going to go purposely fast so that you can't read these, so you have questions, just FYI. I see everyone's confused, like, I can't read that fast. Um, <laughs> these tests are there. Um, it's a good guideline, so if you don't know where to start, this is actually a very nice place to set up, where at least you have a good overarching QA program, but it is very much geared towards the TG40 concept, or the TG142 concept of here is what I do daily, here is what I do monthly, and here is what I do annual. If I check off all the boxes, my state inspector will smile at me. So commissioning, what Jonathan talked about or should have talked about at this point, um, and performance evaluation are, are one and almost the same thing. You may disagree with me. I have people who adamantly disagree with me on this point, but commissioning is what we did in the past. Commissioning includes all of our measuring of the system, the accuracy, determining the system limitations, developing our operational procedures, how we're going to execute different types of treatments, and then also executing a QA type of program. What is our schedule, our daily, monthly, annual schedules? When are we going to do these tests and how often do they need to take place? And then performance evaluation is something that's more of an ongoing commissioning is what we refer to it as. Your QA program should be something that should be adaptable as you move forward, as you add things into your SGRT program. If you move from breast to SBRT lung and you're doing deep inspiration breath load breast for one, your QA program needs to kind of move with you. You need to be able to look at that system and say, I can evaluate this system and the quality of the, it delivers in both of these circumstances. And so a good explanation or a good example of that is one, the deep inspiration breath load for breast versus SBRT. Uh, the workflow is very different, especially if you have a very unlinac and you're talking about peripheral lung lesions or liver lesions where you end up having to do uh, couch centering. How do you handle that with your reference images and monitoring during cone beams? Um, that's oftentimes one of the things when I'm talking to institutions that they didn't think of until the day they had to do the cone beam on the patient. And they're like, oh no, we moved the patient. Now what do we do with this reference? And so that's a good thing to think about ahead of time, not as the patient's laying on the table. Um, and the other things are SRS. Intracranial SRS is very different uh, than those of you who are doing uh, SRS of the base of skull or SRS in the high neck region for things like carotid body tumors. Completely different type of dynamic for surface imaging uh, than doing intracranial SRS. So you need to make sure that your QA program addresses some of the challenges that are associated with those two different things. The validation and calibration process, I'm going to go through these again really quick. There's a lot of words up here. You'll get the slides. There's lots of hidden slides, so you can feel free to pull those out as well. Um, the, the validation of the calibration process, you should understand interdependent steps in your calibration of your system. So if one step depends on another, you need to understand that one step depends on another. Um, you need to make sure that you validate that outside of the software. So on the left, you have the vendor recommended calibrations and checkouts. We recommend, um, and some of the folks that as we go into things like TG302 and APM, there'll be talks on those, um, you start extending the vendor checkout to match the quality of the care that you hope to deliver. So if you're doing SRS, please extend the vendor checkout. Don't just do the plate calibration and be like, well, I'm glad the cameras didn't move. Um, you really need to make sure that you're, you're validating that the camera calibrations and all those other things are still valid each day because uh, you really don't want to find out that they're not on a patient. Uh, the radiographic correction and validation, this is another calibration within the Align RT product. Um, there's other vendors, but uh, I'm not sure what, what stage they're at trying to develop something like this. Uh, Vision RT gives you a vendor supplied cube that has a known geometry. They also have a workspace called MV Isocenter Calibration, um, which has a reference surface or an idealized surface that you can use to kind of calibrate your system to your radiographic isocenter. Uh, that same workspace is used to validate it, so you can take additional images, validate it after you've calibrated your radiographic uh, isocenter in your camera system. Uh, we recommend that the process should be validated against some other process, not just the vendor supplied screen again. Um, so we do an end-to-end -end hidden target test uh, for all of our SRS-based institutions that are doing those types of treatments. Um, we use the five targets and we do a systematic set of tests to find uh, systematic offsets looking statistically at how the, the system responds as you move from isocenter to isocenter, if those are the types of treatments you're doing. System performance for other types of functionality, integration with the machine, 
things like gating. Uh, AlignRT does 6D slash pseudo 7D gating with a time parameter. Um, it's, it's a very nice setup, but you do need to commission that and also have a QA program that checks it, understanding that surface resolution, size of ROI, and all those things go into processing time, which means that goes into your latency measures. And so if you're going to be gating on SRS or you're going to be gating on SBRT and you're going to be using high resolution surfaces, you need to make sure that you're not using ROIs that are inappropriately sized so that the gating latency goes too high and is unacceptable. Uh, same thing with your rigid registration, understanding how the rigid registration algorithm works. Uh, what are the consequences of having an ROI that spans two independently moving body parts? If I'm treating a lymphoma in the neck and I have an ROI that's on a shoulder and a chest and they move independent of one another, what does that do to my rigid registration accuracy? Uh, understanding how that works, understanding how the rigid registration works on a deformable surface, whether it's due to anatomical features or posture, uh, is the abdomen deforming over time because they're a big belly breather or they're a bimodal breather? or are they in a different posture? How does that affect my ROI? So you need to understand those types of things. Uh, treatment planning system, this is one that gets overlooked a lot, even though I harp on it and proselytize this slide all the time. Um, you, need, you need to understand the difference between your DICOM RT surface and your camera perceived surface. The camera works in viewing reflected pseudo random dot patterns, light back to the camera sensor. Um, that is a difference. Uh, modality than looking at thresholding of CT attenuation through the patient surface. So that thresholding will change as your CT gets older, the more load you have on your CT. If you're at a busy CT center um, or you're doing a lot of diagnostic studies on your CT, uh, the CT characteristics, the tube fatigue changes over time, your spectrum gets softer, your DICOM surface changes. We track this once a year as part of our annual and you can actually see a statistical offset get larger between your DICOM surface and between your optical surface. That's something you should probably track because you're going to be using that for SRS. Um, and then you should be validating treatments the, of the types that you plan on using. So if you're doing something like a single isocenter multiple met type of technique, you need to understand leverage effects, size of tumor, distance from isocenter. Um, you can calculate what we call these geometric overlap tables over here on the right and be able to tell your physician if a tumor this size at this distance from isocenter with this rotational uncertainty, this is basically the margin you need to have. Uh, otherwise, you're going to miss this portion of the target. Um, all of these things are very easy to do. These are lots of geometry problems. We all took geometry. Um, fairly easy to calculate for our physicians. Uh, we just have to kind of know the interdependent variables that go into these tables. Um, the part of the talk that I was going to focus on <laughs> was mostly QA. And one of the things that we're doing uh, is uh, tolerance evolution uh, based on an observer-based pattern. QA, uh, over the course of history, uh, has a very well established use of optical systems for measuring the quality of a process. And that's essentially what we're doing. We're, we're trying to determine whether our SGRT process is in control. Um, so we use statistical process control. We use a number of things in our clinics to make sure uh, that our system is well characterized and is not drifting out of control. Um, so using that observer-based pattern, we can use the SGRT system's output to drive the quality of our care. Uh, we use the Max HD Phantom in our centers. We really like this Phantom. IMT is actually here outside. It's one of the vendors. We, we highly recommend this Phantom uh, because of the anthropomorphic nature. So you, you're getting a, a geometry uh, for your imaging that correlates back to what you're going to be seeing, especially for SRS. And then you're also getting a non-symmetric surface that mimics kind of the SRS orientation and geometry you're going to be treating. And so you kind of get best of both worlds for doing your QA programs. Tolerance evolution, what we talk about with tolerance evolution, we started not looking at just dosimetric evaluation of SRS plans. We're looking at geometrically based quality assurance metrics. Uh, and so what we'll do is we use the IMT's Max HD Phantom to our patient, move the isocenter not only to the chamber so that we can do an evaluation dosimetrically and positional with film, but we also can move the isocenter relative to the surface of monitoring so that geometry is maintained. So if the person's head is simmed and it's pitched back, pitched forward, if the distance from the surface to the isocenter is large, um, we make sure that all of those orientations geometrically are established inside the phantom, and then we run a QA on it. So what you see on the left is the QA that we ran on the Max HD uh, for our geometric measures that we're evaluating, and on the right you see the real patient's metric that we took during the actual delivery. There's lots of characteristics that are common between these two. Uh, one of the characteristics I like to point out is it correlates perfectly to the emotional stability of my physician during the treatment. Uh, this is a one millimeter uh, Y axis here. So as we get close to our one millimeter tolerance for SRS, his emotional state gets very distressed. Um, he wants to know why we're getting close to our, our tolerance. 
but the nice thing is, is we can look at the features of these two graphs and they have some basically feature-based registration that we can do. Um, so at the bottom we have time, but if you basically register these two traces on features instead of time, uh, because you may be a lot quicker at doing your QA than you are at treating your patient, you can overlay them based on feature registration. And you can see that my phantom process in my orange dots is almost identical to what we did with our patient. And so our patient wasn't actually physically moving in any way. He was just obeying the nature and the geometry of what we did because I know my phantom wasn't moving. And so while we think that he may have been close to one millimeter during treatment, uh, we actually know he hadn't moved by more than one to two tenths of a millimeter during the course of treatment because he's obeying the kind of the principles of the geometry of what we're doing. Um, this principle can be taken even further. Uh, you can look at the patient QA on number one is the one you saw previously. Uh, that was done about a year ago. Uh, this is a very similar, in fact, almost identical. I had to search through all my QAs and just happened to have one from two weeks ago that has the exact same couch rotations, exact same beam geometries, um, slightly different arc paths, but essentially the same type of treatment. I've done this QA now a year and a half apart almost, and you can see that the characteristic of the geometry of my system in the calibration is almost identical after a year and a half. So this suggests to us that there's some true or real couch geometric offset that we're dealing with, whether it's couch walkout, whether it's a combination of couch walkout and calibration. We have something going on, still a millimeter scale here, so we're still under the millimeter tolerance for SRS, but we can still characterize this fairly easily if we have a proper phantom and a proper QA program. If you do this and you register them together, you can also, we're working on a process of basically doing a reverse isocal for the couch, because none of us, at least I don't think any of us, um, correct me if I'm wrong, are actually trying to correct for couch walkout while our, we're doing our planning. We're not moving our ISO center to account for couch walkout, so why do we care about seeing it? So one of the things that we're looking at in our center is to basically do a reverse calibration and calibrate out the couch walkout, because the optical system is going to show us it, whether it exists or not, but we can actually do it a little bit of trickeration and, and remove it from those things. So we're only actually visualizing real patient motion is which what, what we care about. We did this for a couple of patients. Uh, this over here is an SRT patient. Uh, you can see the, the purple day and the green day. We, these are the traces throughout treatment. You can see that this patient has a MET that's causing them a tremor. Uh, so they're slowly moving away from zero after we take the reference from the cone beam CT. You can see the red line is our one millimeter tolerance. And on the green day and the purple day, they actually went outside of that tolerance. We had to do some imaging, make sure uh, that they were still within. When we checked it, they were within our tolerance, um, but we had to make some small adjustments and of course the physician's emotional state went off the charts as we crossed that red line. Um, so what we ended up doing is looking at, okay, let's take these cases where we're doing all this extra imaging, we're doing all this extra time to validate that the patient's okay. Let's uh, calculate out our couch calibration as if we would have had it and apply it to the trace as if it was applied in real time. And so now we, we apply our couch calibration, we've taken our walkout out, and essentially you look, and the patient was never moving more than a millimeter, they actually stayed below our threshold line every single day. Even though the purple and the green days are still our worst, they, they didn't pass our threshold. It was more a combination of their small movement and our couch walkout, which our couch walkout we're not accounting for. And so if we're not gonna account for it in planning, do we really need to see it in these types of systems? You probably don't, but this is something that maybe in the future will be available, but this is something you can easily do with your QA program so that you know that you're operating within that one millimeter specification of T42. So bridging into other talks, um, these types of QA principles can be done and implemented in a, in a kind of onward, upward fashion. You identify your new application, work through a process, identify the gaps, do your FMEA analysis, then work on pushing a phantom through that process to make sure you didn't forget anything in your FME analysis or do anything that you didn't do, or run into anything that you didn't plan for. And then after the implementation of actual patients, do a review of those patients to make sure that there's things that are not accounted for or things that, uh, that need to be adjusted as you move through. Um, if you need any other opinions uh, other than mine, which I highly recommend, uh, sgrt.org is a good place to go. Post questions, ask physicists, uh, and the medical physics list. Obviously, there's people using these all over the place now. Um, so there's a lot of people doing different things. I recommend those two places as places to get opinions that are not mine. Um, sounds easy. We'll use that for questions and we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, let's see. It says, looking at my official email for course of study here. It says Megan's going to go next. Uh, Megan is going to give a talk on FEMEA analysis. So we're kind of 
transitioning from what is just QA into moving forward into applying that QA to actual treatments. Right. So I'm Megan Bright. I'm a uh, physicist that's part of Carolina's healthcare system, which is now Atrium Health. But that didn't have time really. Oh, no, I did. I got it into the talk. That's good. Um, that's a pretty recent development, our name change. So um, we are one of about somewhere around nine radiation oncology centers in the North and South Carolina region, if you're not familiar with us. All right, so I wanted to talk about something. I knew that the other speakers were going to be talking about QA of the actual equipment uh, for Vision RT um, or SGRT systems. I wanted to talk about how we QA the process of what we do. Um, I had thought about doing an FMEA project for a while, and, and it, it took a little bit to figure out what I really wanted to do it on in the clinic. And then a mistake was made in the clinic, and that helped us make the decision on what to look at for failure modes and effects analysis, because there actually was a failure. Um, so I, I guess just to give you a, a very brief background, because I know these are short talks, um, the mistake occurred um, on a chest wall patient who we did bolus on every other day. And as you all know, a chest wall looks very similar in Vision RT to something that has a, a piece of flab bolus placed over it. They're both pretty flat and pretty homogeneous. Um, not a lot of defining characteristics. So uh, the issue was on port day, ports were taken, it looked great, any shifts that were needed were made. But as soon as the superclav was treated, um, and then we needed to do a breath hold bolus capture, that bolus capture was taken under a non-bolus breath hold field, if that makes sense, in Vision RT. So for the next five days, we were setting up the non-bolus breath hold surface to a surface in Vision RT that really had bolus. And because of the nature of super flab, or the flab bolus, um, it wasn't taped real well on the side that day. We ended up with almost like a three centimeter lateral shift. It was pretty far off and it was only noticed the next imaging day. So we treated the patient like this for a week. So after this, um, we decided as a department to get together and talk about how we can avoid these kind of mistakes, but also just to QA our whole DIVH process. Um, so that's what I'm gonna talk about today, just where we are, um, how, how we came up with the project, um, and then what, what we found so far, and this really is a work in progress because like TG100, this is taking a lot longer than we thought. So where we have yet to go as well. All right, so um, I guess, yeah, all right, let's talk about the scope. So the scope of this talk was to just talk about our process of how we, we went forward um, looking at the failure modes. Uh, for DIBH using Vision RT in our clinic. Um, what we did first was get a group of us together, all, all of the clinicians that had something to do with the actual clinical treatment uh, of these patients. So we, we had at least one physician, uh, we had two physicists, we had two therapists, one was an administrator and one was actually a clinically treating therapist. Um, and then we also, uh, a dosimetrist as well, and then a, uh, a clinical expert at our hospital system in patient safety who's familiar with doing uh, this sort of failure effects analysis um, in other areas of the hospital. So all of us met as a group every couple weeks. Um, what I think what worked for our clinic, and again, if, if you all are thinking about doing this at your clinic, uh, you can do it any way you want. But what worked for us was I did a lot of the work um, before we came to the meeting because what we were finding was when we got together, there was kind of a lot of groupthink 
Um, and people were just like, oh, yeah, okay, yeah, that yeah, sounds good. So I did a lot of the process mapping, well, almost all the process mapping and coming up with failure modes, causes, and effects on my own, brought it to the group, and then I think it's easier for people to say, oh, no, that's wrong, or, you know, <laughs> or I want to really add on to that. So that's how we started the project. When we would come together, um, I did the process mapping. Um, the process maps... Um, really looked more like a process list for us. And again, you can do it any way that's helpful to you all. Um, I'll show you in a slide or two um, what it looked like. But um, we came up with something like um, 11 different steps in the process. And these were pretty uh, high level steps. Um, we didn't really get down to the details because we were leaving that for the actual failure modes and, and the scoring and things like that. Um, and it result, and, all right, so that was the process mapping. We came up with each process. Um, then we came up with all the possible failure modes for these processes, um, which also includes the causes and effects. The detection me methods were the controls that we currently had in place. And that's a really important step because I, I feel like as we were discussing those, you know, it was like, oh, we should do this. And it's like, that's not really the place for that yet. Um, it, it's good to be noting these things, but um, it was eye-opening how few controls we really had. The scoring is where we actually have not gotten to yet. We have gotten through uh, these detection methods, and so the next step would be scoring based on uh, uh, things that you would read in TG100, uh, the likelihood for the failure or cause to occur, how severe uh, those effects are, and how detectable they are based on your current controls. Okay, so this is just a screenshot. This is not ours. This is from TG100. Um, it would have been nice to put everything in this kind of format, but because we were coming from different parts uh, of our department, and in some cases different parts of the hospital, it made more sense to not do it like this. Um, this is more what our process map looked like. Um, with everything in pink, it was a process list, looking like um, uh, pink process, um, blue failure mode, and then all of the causes underneath. After this, we put it into a spreadsheet for easy scoring. But um, So this gives you kind of an idea. In this case, um, so I've got an example, image patient with breath hold. Uh, the possible failure modes were accidentally take a VRT capture when it's not needed, patient just doesn't hold their breath. Um, there's a lot of different possible things that could go wrong um, and also different causes. There's a lot of times overlap too, you'll find if you do a project like this. Um, I think we found something like 65 possible um, failure modes, but there was a lot of repetition in that because sometimes the same thing can go wrong at a different step or in a different manner. Okay, so failure modes. I wanted to look at the example of what went wrong in our clinic. So bolus capture taken during DIBH daily was the step in the process. Uh, potential failure modes, the one that applied to us was the bolus capture was taken with the incorrect surface chosen in Vision RT. There are a lot of other reasons it could have gone wrong, um, but that, that's what happened with us. and. Uh, in our case, we figured what really happened was that um, it was a lack of attention to detail. It was very easy to click on another field and not see that that is the correct field. But that got us thinking. I mean, if things are labeled incorrectly in Vision RT, if that QA of the process is not done at the time of the plan being done, you know, by dosimetry and physics, if the labels are wrong, if, if the surfaces are labeled incorrectly, that's going to be a huge problem as well. Um, and then, of course, the worst possible effects for the failure is that the patient is just not treated accurately. So that was just one step in the process, like I said, but there are a myriad of other steps. Um, but we're short on time. So detection methods. Um, this is the same step. Um, in the same graph, but I also wanted to just show um, what our current detection methods would be for that. And unfortunately, it was things like visual inspection. You know, you just have to pay attention. 
And, um, you know, I put, actually, I put it, <laughs> something, this is incorrect. I put time out with physics for bolus patients. We only did that after the mistake. Um, we really only had, you know, people looking at things. It would be great if there would be some sort of engineering controls that we could uh, put into the system so that, you know, bolus on true beam, and I'm clicking that check box, and yes, I've got a bolus surface in Vision RT. Um, or if there's something else I'm not thinking of. I would love suggestions, but, you know, visual inspection, if people aren't paying attention, um, it, it really makes it difficult to do the right thing. And like I said, now we do do a timeout. Physics, unfortunately, has to come to the machine for every single bolus capture, um, and we do a timeout. We say, what surface is it? What's the date? What's the patient? Just a whole Vision RT timeout. So, the takeaway from our work so far is that it, it is very useful. It's getting us to think about our process in a way that uh, we really hadn't before. Um, and in a way that I, I'm hoping we're going to be able to avoid future mistakes. Um, in the future, uh, our plan is obviously to do this scoring and see where we can make improvements. But because we have so many centers in our system that use Vision RT for DIBH, uh, our, our big plan would be then to include other departments once we finish this work and talk with them and see where we have similar processes and also see where we have differences and maybe they do things better or things that we hadn't thought of. Um, so, and then also we've only focused on the treatment section. We've limited our scope. Um, but we would love to also look at the simulation piece and the uh, treatment planning piece and the actual input of data. TG100 is, I mean, that, that's the main resource I use, but I also wanted to mention a number of years ago there was a summer school and this was a great uh, monogram that's available uh, on the AAPM website. So this quality and safety and radiotherapy, it is a great resource. So that is it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Phil Silgen. Um, I'm the Chief of Physics for uh, Health East Cancer Care. We're a small community hospital based program. We have three sites, um, two with variant accelerators and a cyber knife. And initially our Vision RT was installed at one site and that's the, how we started this program. Um, how many of you out there are already using the system? So do we have some people that haven't even started and are just kind of looking into it? Well, that's good. Um, so, so my talk is on uh, just implementing this technology in the clinic and kind of thinking about developing your program, um, starting from using Align RT for alignment and monitoring, and then moving into DIBH breast, which was the big the big factor for us, our physician really wanted us to move to that quickly, and then moving on into other sites. I don't have any conflicts. So, quick outline where to start this process, um, then we'll talk about uh, starting out with uh, using a line RT, and then moving into DIBH breast, a few, just a few technical considerations, and then moving into other sites. So where to start? So um, technology, training, and teamwork. Um, so what is the technology that you have in your clinic? Um, what, are, what are the unique uh, features of that? We started out, we had a Varian TrueBeam and Vision RT. Um, and then uh, second thing is training. Um, I, I'm a strong believer in a lot of training. So often I hear many people talk about, well, we sent one person to this training and then another physicist to this training. Um, I, in our experience, that, that doesn't work very well. Uh, we found that, for example, we sent multiple people to training, off-site training. Um, we went to the same courses 
and we come back and our notes are completely different. So clearly there's a lot more information that one person just can't get. So um, strongly recommend training as many people as possible. Send your therapist, send your physicist, and, and, then, uh, and then move on from there. And then teamwork. Um, this, uh, this effort of implementing SGRT was a, a very collaborative effort for us. Um, we have the, you know, the physics and therapists working together to achieve quality. So initially, um, we started out, uh, once our true beam went live, uh, we, within about a week or two, um, Align RT, uh, Vision RT came on site to do on site training, and we started using Vision RT right off the bat. Um, every patient, every treatment that we, we, we could. Um, and what that does is it accelerates your learning curve tremendously and um, gets you comfortable with, with the system in, in, in a real way versus with phantoms and things like that. Real problems uh, present themselves. Uh, we also had uh, physics present at the treatment console. So, um, for example, I was at the machine for the first two weeks, every patient, every treatment. So what that did is um, it helped my learning, but it also um, provided um, learning as a group um, and uh, really collaborating and getting comfortable with this paradigm shift. Um, and especially for the therapists initially, it was a big shift, right? Going from, we've heard other talks, moving from tattoos and how they set up patients to, to really doing things in a completely different way. Um, so then we very quickly, within about a month, uh, started with DIBH for left breast. And um, when we, we initially started out, we, were, we wanted to look for uh, a generally healthy uh, patient, good lung function. We thought, well, we, we don't want to get a person that has real pendulous breasts or something like that. And we, we started out with tangents only. Um, so, a couple technical considerations. So when you do the simulation, um, there's an evaluation process in the simulator whether they're going to be a good candidate. I will tell you initially we were very tight with our criteria. We wanted to make sure we had a good patient, a good candidate, and that it was going to work well. Um, since that time, we almost do not reject any patients. Most all of our patients are DIBH for left breast. So, um, so who performs the, the evaluation at the simulation? In our clinic, it started out as physics doing that evaluation. Um, however, we're now into it about three years. Um, I know some clinics have moved, like the therapist or the dosimetrist will do that. We still are doing the evaluations. Um, our physicians uh, really like how our program is going, how smoothly it's going, and so we haven't changed ours, although that's a consideration for you in your own circumstances. Um, we do an explanation of, of what DIBH is to the patient. It's amazing how many patients that I walk into the simulator and they don't have any idea what we're talking about. So a combination of information overload for patients in this position, but also there's quite frequently our physicians kind of forget to talk to them about this, which would be ideal to have the physicians kind of talk about it first and then they come and hear it from us and so it's this, this repeated information. Um, what kind of uh, positioning and immobilization are you going to use? Um, when we first started out, we, um, we, were, we were using a slant board like we did tr uh, traditionally for all of our breast treatments. We, we found um, some issues with pitch, um, and uh, so we, we got rid of the, wing board, or the slant board almost uh, completely. We pretty much have all of our patients on a wing board. We use vac lock only, try to really minimize apparatus, and um, no sponges and, and all of these other things that the physicians sometimes want to try to use. Um, and then the biggest thing, uh, was hand and arm position, and um, 
when we first started out, you know, they would come in and, and they would say to patients, you know, can you put your arm up? And if they couldn't, they would, they would kind of allow that. And, and we really found that that caused some difficulty. So we really push uh, to that you have to be able to grasp that bar because then our setups um, became really solid. And um, our mantra has, has been minimize complexity and then try to, this will maximize reproducibility. So the next thing is, you know, your, your ROIs. Um, one of the biggest areas um, of the learning curve is, is drawing and, and creating uh, good ROIs. So we, we use um, a bilateral uh, ROI for setup, and it may not completely be bilateral, but um, a lot of times for, for uh, left breast, we will come into uh, the other breast, so you get some topography there. Um, and then you, your monitoring ROI can be smaller than that. By, by getting a bilateral uh, ROI at the, uh, at the beginning, um, you make sure you're getting your, your rotations and your roll and stuff like that. Um, the other thing you have to pay attention to, which is always an issue when we, um, when we have difficulties or we see things uh, going out of tolerance, is you pay attention to your topography and also camera visibility. If the camera can't see the region of interest, then you, it's, it's not gonna be successful. And then uh, we, we moved on into you know, even three field breaths. Arm position is crucial. Um, we form the vac lock well, and uh, we always start out with the superclav treating and, and the superclav first. So from, from there, um, after doing uh, DIBH for left breast for you know, easily a year, um, very su successfully, um, we also started our SBRT program. Um, and initially we started out with some, some brain and also um, upper lobe lung using an ITV approach, uh, which is a, a simple way of developing into this. Um, since that time, now we've moved into DIBH. Uh, we've treated livers, um, lower lobe lungs. So the big consideration there is, um, you know, holding their breath for the for the cone beam. We use a cone beam spotlight, and which takes about 40 seconds to complete. So you say, well, how how do we do that? Well, it turns out that um, a lot of patients, especially um, or liver patients where they generally have good lung function, they can hold their breath a lot of times for 20 seconds, 30 seconds, somewhere in there. Um, we now pretty much give most of our patients oxygen, and it is an amazing thing. Um, you take a patient that can hold their breath for 30 seconds, now you give them oxygen, and uh, they can hold their breath for 45 seconds pretty easily. Um, and again, this isn't going to be for all patients, but our experience has been it, it really has worked well. And then we use uh, fiducial verification with uh, triggered imaging to, to make sure in our process. Um, we just uh, recently moved into some lower lobe uh, treatments. Um, patient selection is, is a good place to start. You, you want to start out with somebody that you know is going to be a good candidate and you build on success. So we had a, a gentleman, generally healthy, good breather. He had a solitary met in the lower lobe. And um, he could hold his breath with oxygen almost a minute. It was, it was just tremendous. So we almost didn't even need to use the, elevator, or the spotlight technique for cone beam. Um, and then, and then these, this, uh, the other thing you need to consider is you know, whether you're going to use fiducials or not. And, Actually, using fiducials um, is a great benefit because um, after you do your your DIBH and your cone and your cone beam, and you get your match and you recapture, um, it's a very simple way to take a couple images and verify then that you are correct under your under your DIBH and that your tumor's where you think it is. So. Um, in conclusion, um, start simple. 
Um, we, we used a line RT for all of our setups, so you really increase your knowledge very quickly. Um, teamwork, uh, for us, having physics involvement and being at the treatment console and working with the therapist to answer those questions really helps uh, and helped all of us and the program in general. Because you all know if um, you're in your office and the little questions that come up, they just don't get asked and, and everything gets bypassed. Um, so by being there and being involved, you have an opportunity to educate and to learn yourself. Uh, then we moved into DIBH for left breast and initially really looking at patient selection. Um, over time now we've really loosened the criteria because we've gotten good with the technique and so, so we can be more loose on that. Uh, then we moved into um, liver SBRT with fiducials and the, in the latest software release that, that real-time capture is a tremendous benefit for, for um, uh, grabbing a new surface. And then we've moved into DIBH for lung. So um, thank you. These are a couple of my team members that um, have been instrumental in, in all the work we do. Thanks. Hi, good morning. My name is Grace Kim from UC San Diego. And our department has a one uh, La Jolla main site and then three satellite locations and then um, the total four line RT system installed with the two um, um, CT, gay CT system is installed. So we kind of um, involved a lot of line RT procedures. So from the uh, SRS procedure to the DIVH or the extremity, we used a lot of um, cases with the line RT system. So my um, experience is most likely more focused on the um, true beam based SRS procedure, which is most uh, heavily involved SRS um, treatment. So our clinical workflow in terms of uh, line RT procedure is to start from the CT simulation. So uh, while the CT simulation, the, those creating the mask and the head cushion procedure is heavily involved the uh, line RT. How you create the mask well of the exposure, open, uh, mat, uh, open face area is uh, critical for the accuracy of uh, monitoring system. And in terms of planning aspects of those, the plan isocenter placement and then the body contour is the uh, critical um, point to improve the, your accuracy of the monitoring. And then service image monitoring system, the, actually the um, selecting the ROI is another you know, point. So which is, it depends on, on how you create your mask system. It might giving you the very plain uh, monitoring ROI or it really give you the three dimensional information for the uh, monitoring. And I can uh, go through the details on the next couple of slides for the setup and then how we handle the uh, um, treatment uh, procedures. So our system has the uh, TrueBeam 2.7. 2.7 is required for the HyperArc system, so the, our TrueBeam has a 2.7 and the Varian Eclipse version 15. And then um, the 5.0 align RT system right now, so I'm really excited to have next version available. The 5.1 will be a, a improved uh, technology as well as a better GUI uh, display. And the camera calibration board is a kind of built-in system. And the manual adjuster system is the, uh, from, I think it's the IMT system, yes. And then we used to have only a head adjuster without a 60 pitch, perfect pitch couch. And now we have a all 60 couch function, but still we prefer to have um, this head adjuster on the top of the 60 couch. It looks kind of ridiculous, but the perfect pitch couch has the, some limitation of the adjust. It's like we limit to two degree as the uh, uh, apply the shift as a rotational uh, 
um, shift. So head adjuster will give us more freedom to start begin with a good um, initial point or that we need to um, uh, change the certain position. It, this manual system will give you a little bit more um, freedom to uh, play with. So that's why we keep still using this head adjuster system right now. And then calibration cube is part of SRS package, I believe. And the Winston loss test is a kind of you know basic uh, physics QA test. The city simulation uh, on UC San Diego's um, policy and procedures, we always use the same kind of immobilization system. Also the setup with the um, SRS protocol, which is 1.25 uh, millimeter slide size. Because we use the GE system, GE system has the 1.25 is the kind of you know, drop down menu. So if you have a different CD system, you might end up you know, one millimeter or 1.5 millimeter, that's possible. But the should be a thinner slide size to giving you the better contouring, also better registration function. So as you see that the, here, the, uh, the exposure of the face is until the eye, um, the ears. So those open areas is um, very critical to giving you the 3D information. So for the imaging portion, the metastatic cases you always use the uh, thin slice T1 post contrast, which is uh, usually people call as a sequence name as SPG, uh, S SPG or FSPG. FSPG or brain lab sequence, those are most likely the T1 post contrast with the thin slice sizes. And then the T2 sometimes giving you the, some ideas, and then T2 flare is definitely giving you the uh, peritumor edema. So in our department, always the, uh, the default fusion set is the T1 post contrast thin slice, T1 post contrast, and then T2 flare is a basic uh, fusion before even, even showing the um, uh, physician's con physician review for the target contouring. And if you, uh, there is no MR uh, available, and then CT post contrast is a good uh, way to um, uh, target delineation, or some of the clinic actually using the contrast without contrast to skin, um, CT scan diffuse with MR because MR has some distortion concerns. So what if the, uh, your MR is from the outside? Is You're not necessarily sure that it, it threw the right quality insurance. So then you can see the um, CT, which doesn't have any distortion, and then MR has a distortion. So you can compare between two uh, different uh, enhanced area. So that will give you the better idea. And then usually those MR distortion happen on the uh, temporal or the uh, frontal area. So you will see the score margin area is kind of distorted and then contouring is not match well. There is a couple of publications showing the, those MR distortion. For the ABM, we have a lot of ABM um, cases uh, somehow. So the, from the uh, small one, CM diameter ABM to the, uh, we have a staged ABM to 60 cc, which is the most like a six staged ABM. So every six months we have uh, each stage treatment uh, with the um, full, um, full dose of uh, ABM treatment. And trisaminal neuralgia, Yes, um, 85 to 90, and then there are a couple of cases with retreat the trisem case, which is very intensive. I don't necessarily my, I call it, this is my favorite, but FSPG, the trisem is always the um, nice to with the Fiesta, which is very high resolution T2 um, sequence. So without the Fiesta, I'm not necessarily confident to contour the, or put the beam on the uh, uh, T1, um, high resolution only. So Fiesta will give you the much better uh, visibility of the uh, nerve. For the planning procedure, the body contour again, this is our surface reference. So body contour is important. For example, you have uh, some the metal artifacts and the denture structures or the ABM case, you have a lot of uh, onyx artifacts and then that will, you know, disturb your body contour. So you need to make a very smooth and the more rear uh, uh, body surface for the monitoring. 
And the target structure should be very um, high resolution, not the default. Once you use the default structure set, you kind of compromise with the, uh, your ISO line because you normalize to certain coverage. So if you have a very picky pokey PTV, and then you end up you're blowing whole ISO line to cover not real target because of the resolution of the structure set. So the uh, change the high resolution structure set is the kind of you know default should be default for the SRS procedure. Then the calculation grid size is the uh, important for the SRS pro, uh, calculation. So what we use is a 1.5 um, millimeter calculation grid size, and then Eclipse default size is 2.5. So always the uh, um, change those calculation grid size and make it more accurate calculation. You will see that this kind of difference on the uh, film QA or EPID QA. So those uh, EPID or the film has a much higher resolution. So when you see that those, they are very, you know, heterogeneous peak or profile there, but your Eclipse export plan is very flat and homogeneous, which is that your resolution is not the same as your calculation versus measurement. So on our CT simulation, we don't have any tattoo or uh, BB at all. So most likely the, uh, the therapist will set up the midbrain area and then just to cover the tip of the uh, top of the couch, which will give us the couch vert number on the setup note, which we can easily check the collision test. If the couch vert is more than 22, definitely we will dry run first, and because there is some collision um, um, concern. You said the most like the collision happen on the frontal the area. If your target is a frontal area, then your the lower couch later will collide with the gantry head. And so that's the great uh, way to dry run or to avoid any collisions. And then we put the uh, PTB margin information in the setup note so the, uh, whoever cover the case, they understand what is the PTB margin. We can kind of uh, shut, the, shut down the beam when over the dose tolerance. And then plan evaluation based on um, SRS quality metrics. So more likely gradient index and conformity index on those numbers and then normal brain involvement on the uh, treatment. Patient setup, initial setup, we just, uh, you know, from the bridge of the nose, this is the user origin. We move the user origin in Eclipse to the uh, bridge of the nose, which is the, uh, the therapist set up the patient the, uh, the, on the bridge of the nose with the, the laser line and then start shifting the patient. So not only use the sur using the surface, there is a shift information and then surface. So it's a two layers of a safety feature. So you not necessarily only rely on the surface, you not necessarily only the rely on the shift information. So it's double check together. So even though you accidentally mode up different plan, on the line RT, still you have a, a set of note information, so you will see that the sh shift is not match with your surface, which means something is not right. And then the line RT itself has the uh, function because the, a lot of metastatic patients will be back next year, again, again, again. So the, in that means you have a multiple course exist under the same patient ID which is the uh, kind of increase the, your risk to mode up the uh, previous target, right? So there is a feature you can unapprove the previous courses from the line IT system to only activate one active course, which is the uh, great way to avoid any unexpected event from there. So our initial goal is pre combim uh, setup should be less than five millimeter, less than 0.5, uh, less than 0.5 millimeter, less than 0.5 degree. That's the good starting point. And do KBKB match. And some of the clinic only do comb beam, but we don't wanna deal with the go back to reset up, re comb beam. So KBKB, gross error, adjust, and then start with the comb beam. Doesn't necessarily we apply the twice couch shift because the couch shift itself is uh, including the some kind of uncertainty. So we only apply the couch shift with the comb beam registration. 
because both is a, a rigid registration. It's not necessarily SBRT, which is a KBKB for the rigid registration, and then Combeam is a soft tissue registration. But this one is yeah, both the same bony registration. So only apply the shift once after Combeam registration, and then we acquire the new reference, which means that we uh, take the ground truth from the Combeam information. Most likely your line IT number will very well match with the, your Combeam um, number. So you, you never see the big difference between the uh, before and after um, you capture the surface. And then those new surface will keep wire entire treatment. So we don't we don't recapture the surface after couch kick. It's always uh, using the same surface for all four or five arcs. So the uh, I think Alignity has a certain um, range of monitoring. It's, for example, it's like a longitudinally more than 20 cm shift. Then they kind of lost ab ability to tracking. It's the same as the, uh, when you kick the couch, if you just uh, click the number 45, and then it will kind of all red, which kind of uh, your blink time or dark time. So what I do is always after 20 degree rotation and change the next field. Then you don't have any um, you know, problem with the uh, tracking issue. So it's very smoothly. Uh, change the this ER numbers and then just uh, keep pick up those numbers. So that's kind of avoid any all red situation or insufficient surface to monitor kind of situation. As a SRS procedure, the quality assurance with the ice general calibration is uh, crucial. So there are five features inside the cube which is we use for the, our daily QA currently, including the 60 couch function. So what I designed for the, our integrated uh, uh, daily morning QA is I scan the phantom with the rotation. And then, you know, for the therapist, easy to set up with yeah, just a grid line the, you know, without any rotation. And then they will mold up those plan, which including the all 60 information, and then register and then shift couch and then bring back to the, um, 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 the, the, with the comb beam and then align RT capture. So which is the close the entire IGRT function. So you can confirm the, everything is within tolerance. And then we use the uh, uh, cloud-based QA software to keep monitoring the trend of the, this QA. So these four images is a transfer from the uh, TrueBeam, you know, which is the, uh, this acquired image exists in the uh, iDrive or image server. We can easily transfer to the uh, Alignity IT computer to um, implement this isocellular calibration. So in our experience, most like a translation is a negligible difference, but the rotation are sometimes giving you this little um, you know, fine tuning from the, your master calibration. Always the master calibration is the board, the monthly calibration. This is a fine tuning for the SRS function. So if you see the a lot of deviation, then you can, you know, those that apply mark on the right lower corner, that will gray out, which means your master calibration, your um, isostatic calibration has a lot of you know, deviation, then the alignment will not allow you to apply to those the, um, large shift or large um, you know, tuning. So means you need to go back to the, your monthly calibration, and maybe uh, you might find something you know, miscalibrated from the, your master um, calibration. You know, what I found from my practice is the, uh, we had a little ODI uh, problem, not the problem, but ODI is not accurate as the front pointer. So we used to calibrate the uh, master calibration with the uh, um, ODI, which is embedded in some you know, uncertainty, which made me the, uh, hard to apply the, this kind of calibration. So once I switched to the front pointer, this uh, isostatic calibration is much easier to implement without any problem. 
Our monthly integrated IGRT QA is a, this is basically Winston's test. So this is the um, actually all the ZMAN system with the uh, one tungsten metal ball and then the five four video shirts inside, and then there is a mask, which is I put it in with the uh, coplasma chair. So while Winston lost test, I can check the, uh, my um, KB, cone beam, ice center. At the same time, I can keep tracking the surface. So we can kind of tracking all the information at the same time. And then uh, this is currently in the file mode I testing, but in, if you have a developer mode in your clinic and the Trubim, the developer mode is really easy. Just one push button, deliver all the Winston lots with the couch kick and gantry rotation. So that is um, kind of cool, cool feature, same as the MPC. And this is the image of the, uh, my uh, MRC-based SRS QA and then cone-based cone. We use a 1.75 cone size for the Winston loss test, and then the MRC-based is 2 by 2 field size uh, Winston loss test. So I'm going to introduce the hierarchical concept. It's coming soon. It's a 15.5. Maybe. Uh, Maybe some of you already started using the hyperarch function, but we are kind of a transition from the current our technique to the hyperarch right now. So it might be a, you know, useful as a you know audience to learn about the hyperarch concept. So hyperarch has a four arc fixed geometry, which is the 45, 315, and then 270 is a fixed geometry. And I think most of the SRS. Um, plan done by those geometry, you know, as I do. But um, the only the drawback is when I make the very complicated multi cases, single-eyes multi case, I need to play with the more different arc angles to avoid any shadow island effects. So that's kind of a little drawback, because there is no way to I can adjust those angles at all. Only the I can play is just get rid of one arc. That's what I can do in the uh, hyperarch function. And then uh, it achieved the optimal dose coverage, highest conformity, sparing the normal tissue with the non coplanar arcs. And then collision prevention is embedded. So the their mask system has the, their registration point, so they, um, the machine knows where is the mask. So uh, if that is the, um, not the uh, safe location, and then the plan itself is not passed through the, um, the approval uh, procedure. And the order treatment will be uh, automatic, enabled automatic, so no in and out time, so which will improve a lot of procedure. So if I compare the contrast between the current SRS and the hyperarch SS, SRS, and the automation efficiency is a key element, and then safety features, and then simplify the treatment planning procedure, and then some additional imaging is the new feature. I'm more excited for the simplify the treatment planning procedure. We kind of underestimate the, uh, this uh, treatment planning procedure, but I think that would be really cool. And since our clinic use a lot of uh, rapid plan right now, so it's going to be um, you know additional good feature to use our automatic planning system. So. Let me show you that this is our one of our treatment history. This patient treat with the uh, single shot FFF. So each arc take about four minutes, four and a half minutes. And then total delivery time for arc is 16 minutes, 37 seconds. And the beam on time itself is 7 minutes, 25 seconds. So which means the gantry, kilometer motion, and then in and out time is 9 minutes, 12 seconds. So from the, this hyper arc function, we can save this 9 minutes, 12 seconds time. It's kind of a 50% you know, discount. So it might be a, uh, improve a lot of um, procedure time. Also, we can treat the multi ISO or or multiple plans in one time slot is possible. And then as a safety feature in mobilization, this is a QFIX in Compass. For now, this is the default. So we can change the um, you know, mask system, but in Compass it has some registration point on the uh, corner of the frame, so which will eclipse giving them to a safety feature to check the order clearance. 
and then integral byte is actually put in the, the byte block kind of type, and it, which improved a lot of a pitch issue. You, you might, if you treat a lot of SRS patient, you need to deal with this pitch issue because the CT versus the Linux has a different, you know, uh, sagging of the couch or, or patient is hard to reproduce the same position, but the camera angle is really sensitive with the pitch position too. So this is the planning portion. The planning um, portion, we have the uh, only fixed four arc system and then automatically IC center will be defined. And then collimator rotation is automatically optimized. And then jaw setting also optimized by the uh, planning system. And you can unclick the uh, one of arc, then that beam will be removed from your optimization. And then for the uh, uh, optimization window and there is NTO, different NTO named as SRS NTO, which is the uh, quite different than the current NTO. Current NTO is very kind of a slow slope. It's not steep enough for the SRS plan. So when we make the uh, SRS plan, if we use NTO, it's not working well. Even though you kind of push a lot with making very high gradient, but still it's not working well because the NTO is based on the uh, hot spot not necessarily your prescription dose. So, which is the kind of, we end up with those control structure, right? You know that those, the UAV introduced some inner control, middle control structure, and outer control structure really work well with the SRS procedure, but NTO is not necessarily ideal for those kind of function, but HyperArc has the, uh, SRS a specific NTO set up here, so maybe this will help you uh, play with the better um, uh, plan quality without the control structure. I will test with the, with the without control structure later. And the structure resolution is a uh, fine, 1.25 is default for the SRS. You, you, know, you don't need to click and change to fine. So that's the great feature. And all the optimization is automatically populated in terms of both prescription dose. And then also the nice feature is the, um, the index. You guys have a very hard time to recalc a PADIC index or PADIC gradient. Yeah, so which is the, not necessarily um, Eclipse giving you the dose PADIC comparable index. You, you, kind of, you can pick up the uh, gradient measurement and then conformity index from the statistics, but not necessarily PADIC index, but the uh, HyperArc will provide uh, those or different metrics you can choose. I wanna see the order comparison based on the PADIC index and you can you know, just click the button and you will see the those measurement results based on the each target, not one target. The Eclipse currently only using the one metric based on the whatever you normalize to. But this one will give you the each target index will be provided by. Also, there is some additional imaging feature. Every couch kick, you can do the MV imaging. So making sure the patient is not you know, moved while the, those rotations. And also the MCO is a great feature of the 15.5. So uh, UCSD has been implemented this uh, line IT system from 2009 in clinically, and then we've been, you know, play with the, maybe 2006 or seven, but uh, tons of cases already, um, you know, built into the, our database. This is a clinical outcome for the one ISOS multimed case or uh, benign score base case or trigeminal neuralgia case, there is outcome. Um, publication there, and this is the, our risk assessment uh, publication, FMEA. We have very good um, process details here, so if you want to start your SRS program now, you can um, you look at the, this first publication. It's very detailed the process, what can go wrong, and the, what kind of process. Actually, the, all the Linux-based SRS procedure is very similar, 
right, from the same to the treatment is very similar. So you can use these process maps from the FMEA uh, built into the, your FMEA, and then you can kind of modify based on the, your um, you know, needs. And the second publication is the healthcare FMEA. So the first one, the TG100 FMEA is very um, comprehensive, and which is the first paper. And then a lot of clinics which start SRS program right now, and then they don't necessarily know what is the detectability, you know. Can I detect? Because we never done before, so we don't know what is the detectability would be. So the healthcare FMEA is more likely you go with the uh, occurrence and then severity first, and then make us some um, risk inventory metric, and then diagnosis the detectability. So a little bit easier to implement. That's the healthcare FMEA. And the third paper is the system and control theory-based hazard analysis. That's another way to you can uh, evaluate those risks. So three papers is based on the, our uh, surface image monitoring the risk assessment. And another publication is the uh, plan specific action limit. Right now, we put the tolerance as one millimeter for the SRS. Maybe we do. Yes, because we put the PTB margin as one millimeter, and then also the wins and loss test, we kind of confirm, okay, we can you know, guarantee one millimeter tolerance is doable. So that's why we apply the one millimeter target, but it really depends on the, your plan. If you have a one ISO multi-med case, you need to deal with already a small error and make a big miss target. So, which is that this paper addressed, um, you know, depends on your plan. How many multimeds from the ISO, how far offset, and you need to really control the, those the tolerance based on the, your patient's specific way. And then the left side of the paper is a JSMP paper for the uh, um, ISO standard calibration is from the, uh, uh, how you use this uh, ISO standard calibration, how you can improve this ISO standard calibration um, on the top of the master calibration. That's the publication is uh, uh, addressed. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for four really great talks. Um, hopefully all of us have some questions. I think this is a great opportunity. We've got 30 minutes now. This is kind of your floor at this point. If you have any comments about what we've heard, any of your personal experiences, and while we've got this excellent uh, panel here, it'll be great to ask questions as well. So I know you've all been writing down questions for the past hour or so. So we have a first taker. Uh, my question is about the uh, inhaled breast hold. Um, because all the breast hold I, I'm hearing is a deep yeah, inhale. Uh, but for liver, we sometimes prefer exhale, breast hold and exhale. Is, there, is, it, is this doable with a vision, vision ID or is it somehow it's never talked about? It breaks hold on a deep exhale for liver. Um, as, as far as deep expiration breath hold, um, we don't necessarily monitor uh, using SGRT and a deep expiration breath hold for liver. Uh, we use deep expiration breath hold in conjunction with like a mechanical limitation device. We use a uniform abdominal compression mask uh, for our liver SBRT, and those are actually applied under deep expiration breath hold. Uh, the reason why we use a mechanical device to basically hold them in that position is once you get the, the diaphragm up in that deep expiration, we use the mass to limit that diaphragm motion for the 4D CT using gate CT uh, as well as for delivery. But it's, it's very difficult for patients to maintain a long, deep expiration breath hold. Um, I, I don't know if anyone's ever tried to treat under expiration breath hold without having some sort of limiting device to to, to maintain that position. So um, I, I'd be interested to hear if someone has tried to treat kind of a, a natural deep expiration breath hold using a liner T, but I'm not sure that there's enough deviation in surface to, to, to guarantee that you're holding that position without some other type of mechanically limiting device.
So when you're doing these uh, abdominal compressions with uh, either the pressure band or a, a paddle, um, how are you getting the surface guided to register everything? Because you know it might be blocking some portion of the ROI, or what, what, where are your ROIs in that case? Uh, if you're using a, like a uniform abdominal compression mask, we use the Orfit AO solution, which is the masking system uh, that has a base plate that allows you essentially to mask a patient from eyes to thighs. So um, there's a number of different mask configurations. So in the case of like a liver SBRT, we'll have them do a deep expiration breath hold. We place the abdominal mask on, and usually an abdominal mask will come kind of mid-thorax. And so we will fold that down to just under the rib cage. And then as we fold that down, because we, we also need a place to do a trace for a 4D CT, uh, which is accomplished using the Gate CT product. Uh, so it's an al also an optical surface tracking system for, for CT and 4D acquisition. Uh, so what we do is we end up folding the mask down to fit the patient's anatomy. So as they're in the deep expiration breath hold, once we get the mask just below their rib cage, we then use basically a cold, wet towel to basically uniformly compress the patient. And hold, it's essentially just using a mechanical advantage at that point to hold the diaphragm up. But then that leaves a large area for your monitoring ROI to make sure they're both straight in the mask and if they try to kind of fidget and escape during treatment. <laughs> we use, Civ oh, sorry. We use Civco's solution for SBRT. And honestly, we haven't had issues with the ROI for livers. Um, or lungs, because um, a lot of, I mean, you can shape the ROI however you need to, and you can kind of extend it into the chest area or more of the sides. So it's, we haven't had any issues. I have a question for the panel, because I'm interested in hearing what people do. Um, is any patient-specific QA done? So before the patient is treated, is there someone that reviews the surfaces and the labeling? And then on a weekly basis, I know for physicists especially, I mean, we do weekly chart checks. Is there something that's done on a weekly basis or monthly? Is there any patient-specific QA who does it? Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're not doing extensive patient QA, but our, our physics team is involved, um, you know, up front. Um, in the treatments, um, we do do a chart review after the first fraction with all of our SBRT because of the short fraction scheme. We don't wait for a, a weekly chart check. Um, but the physicists are, are we, we generally have one person do the ROIs and, and then another person kind of review, yeah. Uh, for us, we, we do an initial chart check. Uh, during our initial chart evaluation, we go into the system. We verify the isocenter coordinates to make sure the right plan was pushed over. Uh, we verify the surface uh, definition. So if it's an SBRT, that they, did they choose an SBRT surface because that affects the resolution of the surface. Uh, if it's an intracranial SRS, making sure it was imported as an intracranial SRS uh, surface and not a brain or something like that, which gives you lower resolution. And then we also evaluate the ROI for it being created pr appropriately, uh, whether it includes mask material or something like that. Uh, if it's a breast or some standard treatment, make sure that it doesn't include shoulder and chest because they move independent of one another. Um, if it's a large pendulous breast or prone breast, to make sure that the ROIs have been drawn appropriately because we draw um, statistics from all of our patients. So like in the case you were bringing up about a chest wall being captured, we correlate our um, tolerance tables in Eclipse to the tolerance tables and we use the output of the SGRT system to statistically evaluate all of our tolerance tables all the time so that the tolerance table for SGRT matches the tolerance table selected for treatment on the couch. That way, if something was to happen on SGRT, you did have a surface that was captured in the wrong place or something, that you, it would require the therapist to also override the couch. And that is their trigger to say, wait a minute, something's not right. We've lined up with a, a line RT. Why do we need to override by a centimeter on the couch? We should be pretty good because we index all of our patients. So. We're checking to make sure the tolerances that we selected in there also match up with our couch tolerances as well. So our clinic doesn't necessarily have the patient-specific um, surface QA, but we 
since we have a kind of a little bigger um, department, we kind of try to uh, improve the uh, communication or, or, or workflow. So we embedded some checklist of the uh, surface exporting from the dossier aspects. So we built into the checklist of the area, and then we have a care pass generated for the LNRT import. So the uh, always a physicist assigned for the importing. So without any drop down or the uh, dropping the ball or, or any rush importing, which is the uh, more risk to mistake uh, you know, importing different surfaces. So that's those workflow improvement is a big thing for us to, you know, to set up in our workflow. Yeah. Uh, I had a quality assurance commissioning question. Um, how, what tests are you using to quantify a lag in the system? Lag from a gating standpoint? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So if the patient moves out of position, the system's supposed to cut the beam, mm -hmm. and how much lag we get between that and you know between the detection and the cutout, or so the motion and the cutout. So one of the things you can look, use, and it depends on what type of machine you have. So like I, I can speak to essentially the true beams that we use this on. Um, we have the trajectory log files. Um, you can also use a test where you have. Um, if you have an old RPM phantom or some sort of motion phantom that actually physically moves, um, we will look at, uh, we, we essentially set up a port image with a very small BB, and we can see the port, if we set the gating to a very small window, something like half a millimeter, you can then have the port, and it will literally gate the port and not allow the beam to turn on and port until that is in the, within a half a millimeter, essentially. And what we're doing is making sure that that, that port crosshairs ends up in the BB. So um, you can calculate based on whatever the period of your phantom is and full disclosure, if you have dead batteries, it's gonna be slower, so don't just assume it's always the same. Uh, we, we do lots of site visits and I've seen lots of RPM phantoms degrade over time and get little funny signals in them. So, but if you, you can actually calculate what the, the excursion is from IsoCenter and then that gives you your lag time. You can also use the trajectory log files to see when the beam on was initiated and when it actually was held. Um, you can use the, that information. And then they also, you can set up the system to put out real-time deltas, and I'm not sure if they're writing it in, the beam holds into the real-time delta files. These guys <laughs> up front can probably tell you at this point. Uh, but they do have a flag for when it's issuing a beam hold with a timestamp, and so you can cross-correlate those as well as when it was issued in their log file versus uh, when it was triggered in, in the trajectory log. So there's different ways you can do it. We usually do it uh, imaging-based because it's a little bit easier to calculate what that lag time is. Um, just simply because you can use a very small BB. You can buy small half millimeter tungsten carbide BBs and place them on a phantom that moves up and down and put an isocenter in them and it's a pretty easy, straightforward way of doing things. So um, we do that, but we also have written our own trajectory log analysis stuff and there's other commercial tools that will analyze the trajectory logs as well for you. Thank you. So I have a question about uh, Hyperarc. He gave a Nice introduction to that. Um, what role do you see SGRT playing in treatments for, for Hyperarc? And do you have any experience of this? And I think kind of following on from what Mike was talking about earlier as well, um, obviously the leverage effect, the further the PTV is away from ISO center for these single ISO multimet treatments, the bigger the significance of motion. So do you see SGRT as playing a role in kind of managing this motion throughout treatment? For the hyperarc high function, we just transitioned to the hyperarc, so it's not necessarily I can easily say about the SGRT um, roles. It's, it's going to be the same. We will you know, take as current uh, procedure, so we keep monitoring. The only the, uh, um, challenge will be how secure the open face on current QFIX encompass mask, which is um, kind of a little bit smaller opening. Um, phase area, so we need to play with the, what would be the optimal level of the uh, the cheek lines and the forehead lines and then the uh, the side lines. That's the most tricky part. And then in terms of patient specific things, there are a couple of you know publications. So SCRT is definitely a um, great tool to uh, see any uh, you know. Um, rotation is involved the wire, the uh, couch rotation, or the, even the uh, uh, off-axis treatment. So it will be, yeah. Without the, those, the uh, monitoring uh, capability, it is hard to, you know, justify the. We kind of deliver the off-axis uh, uh, correctly. 
So I think it's monitoring is crucial. A lot of physicists in the room here, so I thought it might be useful to get a quick poll on kind of what people are typically doing for their ongoing QA commissioning type procedures. So um, we had a nice introduction to start with, but how many people here follow TG147 with respect to commissioning QA? So we've got a great got a handful here. Um, and how many of us, um, with respect to the, the tools that are available within the SGRC solutions, so we talked about AlignRT, for example, having monthly calibration, daily QA. Uh, how many of us here basically use that as the full extent of their, their QA for the system? There's no right or wrong answers. So. Great, and so I was kind of a question for the panel then. Um, so what responsibility do you think the vendor has, uh, any vendor for SGRT has, for kind of defining these type of tests? Or again, Mike, something you mentioned was it's always good to test things outside of vendor software to kind of validate the system independently. Uh, kind of what, what are your thoughts along those lines? Kind of what responsibilities are? Uh, I'd like to see, I mean, we do a lot of, I mean, I come from a, a process control type of background, so I do a lot of statistical process control um, to evaluate systems that I don't understand. So largely, when SGRT came into the market, it was one of these things that was uniquely decoupled from the rest of the system. We weren't using radiographic images. Nothing was truly attached to the machine, which was then attached to ISO Center. So we had to come up with ways to determine whether these systems were behaving properly or behaving in some, some controlled manner. Um, so being I have the background that I have, I, I, I fall back on the things that I know, and everybody has a different background, but we fall back on stats a lot. And so we, we are heavy, intensive QA people uh, at my centers. I typically find physicists that have OCD, and I welcome them into the club. Um, and so <laughs> we, we trend things over long periods of time. So we do a lot of TG147. We actually do all of the daily and the monthly and some of the annual every morning from TG147. And the reason is it's hard to get statistically good samples of data when you only do it once a month. You have 12 data points. Some of the statistical tests require seven points on one side of the mean before you can tell if the, if the process is going out of control. Uh, I think in the future, vendors uh, providing those tools, uh, rather than relying on a schmuck like myself to go and code those tools, um, something in the software, because you guys put out a, a huge glut of data. I mean, all of those traces for every patient, um, we've written stuff that goes through and evaluates those and gives those stats to our doctors to make sure that those are, are good things. I think the challenge for vendors in the future are gonna be how do we distill this information down to provide some quality metrics to the physician or to the physicist or to the staff uh, in a real-time manner to say this process is possibly going out of control. Um, something like evaluating uh, a possible couch calibration, because I mean, we had a number of really good conversations last night at the, the mixer and things about, you know, what do I really care about? I really care about the patient moving because none of us before SGRT, or at least I hope none of us, we're, we're going in and moving our ISO center around in our treatment planning system to account for our couch walkout. It's part of our QA. It's part of our calibration and our commissioning. And so we know that part of the uncertainty of the system is the couch walkout. So why do I need an optical guidance system to tell me I have couch walkout? I'm aware of the couch walkout. Uh, it's a great QA tool, um, but I think the vendors can start looking at ways of providing kind of distilled information to users rather than requiring the users to kind of, like Varian's a good example that, I mean, that Truvian machine puts out gigabytes of data every second as far as trajectory logs and all kinds of things. It's all great information, but I need a tool to give me that QA. And, and right now, if you have the luxury of knowing how to code or you have graduate students who know how to code or whatever, you can get a lot of that information. And I think it's extremely valuable moving to TG100 principles of where do we focus our efforts? Because I've got nine facilities, I've got cyber knives and five HDRs and IORT and comms and all these prostate seed implants I gotta do and all these things. Where do I focus my effort on when I'm introducing these new types of systems? Having the vendor say, okay, here's, here's the type of data we're providing and here's how we distill it down for you and then let the physicist decide uh, on his own, but not have to kind of go to the extra effort of how do I determine if this process is in control. Not just give me, okay, run this QA phantom and you're good. Yeah, because it's going to tell me it's good, but that's why we always recommend do another process just to make sure that the vendor's process is at least something good. Because we're, we're not getting data, 
we're getting a, a, a check mark. Is it, is it good or bad? So getting the data and letting the physicists kind of determine what to do with that data in a distilled fashion would be extremely helpful, I think, for the physicists. On that same note, since we have a very quiet group of people. Um, for those of you who have it, or the, those of you who are going to implement it, how many of you plan on using the SGRT system to QA your other systems? Oh, he, look, his hand shot up super fast. You're my favorite guy in the whole room right now. <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the SGRT systems are absolutely phenomenal systems as far as, like I said, it, it's an observer that observes your commissioning. Um, we do a lot of nerding out in the evenings. We have very sad lives in Colorado. We have mountains and skiing, but we stay inside and stare at machines, do things. Um, but it's, it's really nice to have a, another set of eyes, especially eyes that are sub-millimeter precision. Um, if you really want to take your QA to a ridiculous, maybe a insane level uh, that people will mock you for later on, which I'm okay with, um, you can map your couch walkouts. You can map all kinds of different things. We do a lot of QA with our SGRT system. Uh, because of my background in industrial process control and a, a number of other things that we did, you can use that observer as something to measure. I mean, if you can measure thousands of parts per hour optically, you can measure the walkout of your couch relatively easily. Um, those types of things help you when you're implementing SRS programs mm -hmm. and things like that when the physician turns to you in the middle of an SRS and says, did the patient move? And you don't know because it, is it the couch? Is it this? Did I do the right QA? It's very easy to be like, that's not real. Rotate the couch or bring the gantry back up and it'll go away. Uh, understanding your system to that level gives you a comfort when you're doing these types of treatments that everything's okay. And when you move into things like HyperArc and those types of things, it almost, if you didn't have SGRT, I would almost not be able to function in a clinic at this point. It's to the point where I rely on that system to tell me what I already know about my system. And if it tells me something different, I know there's something wrong and we can stop that process right now. Or instead of kind of looking back and forth at each other and trying to guess, is it a camera, is it this, or is it that? It, it's, it's a very confirming, nice feeling that there's some eyes in the sky in there making sure everything's going okay. So can I take a couple of comments and kind of pull them together then? So um, to use the system to QA kind of mechanical aspects of your Linux and couch, I think that's a great application and I think it's very appropriate. Um, you asked a kind of rhetorical question earlier saying, I assume nobody here uses surface guidance to basically um, get rid of couch walkout, so to correct for couch walkout. In the future, do you ever see that as a useful application? Is that something you'd ever consider doing um, if you trust surface imaging as kind of the, the overarching kind of gold standard of position? Uh, I attempted to do that early on. Take, I have a 2D motion table that we built from linear actuators and we're like, okay, well let's simulate the motion of a patient on the table independent of the table and then use the couch move features when we were checking our MMI and commissioning MMI to basically recorrect and do a wince and lutz after each time we correct, are we getting back to true isocenter or are we actually walking off? If you actually do the math, you're actually just oscillating around a point. So you can be like me and be foolish and try to unprove the provable math problem, or you can just trust and do the math problem on paper. You're basically just going to oscillate around isocenter. Because what you have is you have noise in your camera, you have noise in the signal, and that noise is around a tenth. And then my walk couch walkout is going to be about two tenths. And then I have an optical surface to isocenter offset that I have to account for, which is what we were showing there with the, the Max HD Phantom. So I have all these competing things, and what we ended up doing was devising this grand experiment and finding out the Winston Lutz gave me the exact same answer as when I didn't do it with the Winston Lutz. And so um, you're really kind of fighting a losing battle by oscillating on either side of it, um, at least on a true beam. Now, I, I, I have an Electa that's in mothballs right now, but when we were doing Winston Lutz on that, we didn't, obviously didn't have a surface-guided system on that, but it had a much more coarse isocenter at the time. Uh, so I think as long as the isocenter of the machine is not on the order of the kind of uncertainties that you're playing with, it'll be okay. Uh, and you can get some benefit out of it. But I think now with the machines, the way they're made, um, you're just really gilding the lily at that point. You're just per teasing yourself if you think you're getting any better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so regarding the QA tool with this S um, surface monitoring, uh, because we have a Halcyon system, so Halcyon doesn't have ODI or uh, field, light field, so which makes, uh, we have a two camera system in the Halcyon 
the online RT system. So we uh, not only the user clinically set up the patient, we use the uh, QA device with the, based on the uh, online RT system without the uh, you know, ODI or any information. Harrison is basically CT. So that really helped us to accurately uh, position the QA devices. Also, the uh, dominant, uh, significant improved the uh, brain position of the you know, Harrison patient. I've got two. Um, a lot of you have talked about custom software and tools you've prepared for doing specific tasks that improve your QA. Um, is there a place or would the SGRT community be willing to make a place where these tools could be shared freely? And that might be more a question for uh, the Align RT folks. Um, but just kind of a curiosity question. My tools just typically get emailed to people who ask me, but they come with like very large disclaimers of, I don't know what you're going to do with this, and it's on you, ma my friend. <laughs> um, Naturally. But, yeah, most of my tools are, are, are mostly trending of data that they export. Mm -hmm. um, like I said, a lot of our stuff is, is focused around QA and just making sure the process is staying in control. I don't have a camera drift or something crazy like that. Um, we don't develop software, we just develop analysis tools essentially. But I mean, they used to have a, I don't know if anybody remembers the MedFizz files, Nathan Childress's little website that he used to have where you could post free stuff. Um, some people will let you use it, some people won't. I, I tend to, you know, if you want to use it, but you're a big boy and don't call me. I'm not tech support. <laughs> um, it's one of those things, <laughs> it's one of those Godspeed type of things, I'll give it to you and whatever. But um, I think the SGRT, we've talked a number of times with the SGRT folks who run the website about being able to post files. I get a lot of questions. I did something like 52 site visits last year. People wanting, hey, I'm starting a program. I did a site visit. Can I see your morning warm-up routine? And do you have instructions on how to do it? Right now, I just email that stuff out most of the time. And it, I'll, I'll respond to someone on the SGRT forum, and then they'll respond back to me privately and say, hey, can I get a copy of that? Um, I think having a file repository or something like that would be fantastic where someone who's starting a program can say, okay, here's this person. It would be a giant disclaimer of, you know, this is not your configuration, but if you want to use this as a jumping off point, again, full disclosure, it's on the physicist at the site. You make it as scary of a disclaimer as you want. Um, use at your own risk. But I, I like those types of things. I oftentimes go around and look for tools like that or people have kind of already invented the wheel so I don't have to do it. Um, but the, the nature of the beast is a lot of, there's a lot of one-off things that just get made in clinics and, and and the things that we make are not as refined as things like Wash U has a ton of stuff that's really cool. Um, wish I could have type of deal, but I just don't have armies of physicists to do that type of thing for me. So ours, ours are much less refined, but I think having a place like a, a catch-all dumpster where everybody can throw their stuff and you can dig through it and decide what works for your program, especially protocols and things like that. Like, how do you set up your gate CTQA? How do you set up your morning QA? Those types of things, I think. Because a lot of the stuff that they export and, and those types of things aren't like varying whether proprietary formats, they're basically comma separated values, so Excel goes a long way. Um, so some of those things are easier to recreate and other things aren't. Yeah, I think um, I've developed some small things, just getting into it, but you sit there and sometimes you just think, oh my God, somebody somewhere must have done this already, you know, why am I doing this? And I think that happens a lot you know in our field. <laughs> yeah. um, but even things like uh, sharing an FMEA, you know, I think for a lot of people who haven't done one, seeing a good example in the domain where they're going to be working is valuable. Um, and with FMEA, the more ideas you have, the better it's going to be, and so kind of seeing that external perspective is valuable. All right, here's my, I guess, more specific question. Um, could you speak to the challenges of doing uh, frameless uh, SRS with SGRT when the ISO center is uh, you know, farther out of plane relative to your surface? So um, you know, one of the pieces of advice we got yesterday was uh, take your surface and put it around or close to or over your ISO center 
but uh, for certain SRS locations, that's not going to be possible. Um, could you speak to some of the specific challenges with that? For the SRS, its brain size is kind of limited. It's even though they're extreme um, far away, it's not necessarily you know, over 10 or 12 centimeter off axis. So it, it is kind of a brain is secure. So we have a lot of question about the, how you deal with the uh, large MRC for the meta multimate cases, which is uh, almost never happen because the brain size is very limited. So we're nev never going to use the large MRC, always use the thinner MRC. And then, you know, off axis, so what you test with your small phantom will be uh, secure. What is you have uh, an uncertainty in terms of off axis? Maybe SBRT is a different story. <laughs> SRS, both intracranially and base of skull and high neck with uh, carotid body tumors and those types of things, um, that does get into, you're talking 16 centimeters if you're not lining up a single isocenter. Um, I don't recommend doing that, honestly. Um, I'm not a big, you know, rah-rah fan of single isocenter multiple METs. I'm not quite there yet. Um, we do those types of treatments in our centers and we do the QA for them, but we try to cluster them so that the, the maximum distance from isocenter is never more than three centimeters for any one lesion. So you're basically treating quadrants of the brain, so that kind of helps even limit some of those leverage effects as well. Um, but there are isocenter effects. Um, we did a white paper for the IMT guys with the Max HD. Um, we like the Max HD because it does give you uh, kind of a anatomically correct size head that will fuse to most of your patients relatively closely. Uh, so you can kind of monitor and watch some of those deep posterior inferior isocenters uh, that are a long distance away from the face that you're actually monitoring. Um, we tell everyone you're, when you're commissioning, you really need to do those things. We used to do it with the cube um, that is provided. You can do it. It's a 15 by 15 cube, which isn't quite the size of a head. Um, so we have found really posterior inferior lesions are kind of outside of our cube commissioning that we did. So we went back and redid our commissioning with the Max HD. Uh, so that we were really anatomically picking regions where we're finding these things. And then we basically commission our system at the extreme ends of those spectrums. So we know that we can hold a millimeter even though we are at the maximum extent in the head, both anterior, posterior, left, right, because um, you always get that like meningioma that's like right on the temporal bone or something. And it's, it's just way off to one side. Um, and you can see some camera effects that are associated with those types of orientations. And so we try to make sure that even at the most extreme positions within intracranial SRS vaults, as far as the intracranial vault itself, um, that we're, we're testing the system at those maximum extents so that when we inevitably, your very first SRS will be a posterior inferior right on the brainstem, you know, absolutely awful position. And you have to make sure that you have collision clearance with your cones, or if you're not using cones in HGMLC, that you have a right, you know, commissioning to go along with that. And that's why I say your QA program should be designed knowing ahead of time what your end goal is. You, you don't design a QA program and then decide, well, okay, what type of treatments we want to do with this system. You decide what your treatments are going to be, and then you design QA systems and, and performance evaluations that go along with those types of treatments. Because if you don't think about it ahead of time, I can guarantee you your first case will be in an absolutely awful position. <laughs> I think it really depends on the, how the mats, multi-mats location is. is. If there is a way far from the frontal to the cerebellum area, and then you can cluster them as a two ISO, but if there is a scattered 20 mats everywhere, then you know, p patient really want an SRS, then you would better to uh, locate your ice center mid-brain and then cover the old area at the same time. That's the best solution in terms of plan quality. If you have a multiple ISO and then those contribution from the non coplanar beams that you can avoid to achieve your coverage, then end up your plan sum will be terrible. It's like a double up, 20%, uh, no, 200% of the dose of spear everywhere. So I think in that case, it's, uh, definitely you want to try the one ISO multimate case. We've been treating one ISO multimate many, many years. So I think it's, it will be uh, um, beneficial for the patient in terms of, um, you know, um, block the, any low-dose spirit at the same time, you know, cover well with the PTV area. Great. Well, I think that's perfect timing. I think we'd like to all thank again the, the panel for some great discussions. <laughs>